After studying this module, you shall be able to know what is MRI and why it is used, know what is CT scan and why it is used, know what is PET and why it is used, also, you will know about the use of PET in studying memory. You will also come to understand how we are controlled by the two brains. People worldwide suffer from physical and mental ailments ranging from arthritis to Alzheimer's. These kinds of diseases and disorders no doubt require a thorough and appropriate diagnosis. It is very common for us to face situations in life where proper diagnosis is not made. In many cases, this has even resulted in fatal consequences. For appropriate diagnosis, the various scans come to our rescue. These include MRI, X-rays, CT, PET, etc. Here in this module, we will discuss about MRI, CT, PET scans, the cases in which these are used by a doctor. We also discuss the procedures followed during these CT scans. Later, we will talk about studying memory with the help of PET scans. We will see how a PET scan can help us in predicting potential mental illnesses. In the end, we will talk about the two brains we have, that is the left and the right brain. The areas of governance of these two brains vary from each other. They together work to create our perception of this world. Let us first take up MRI. MRI is short for Magnetic Resonance Imaging. It's a procedure put to use in hospitals and clinic settings to scan patients for any injuries and determine their severity if they exist. It uses magnetic field and radio waves to create detailed images of the body. The most commonly found reason for people visiting hospitals for an MRI are ankle sprain and back problems. For an MRI test, the area of the body being studied is placed inside a special machine which contains a strong magnet. It's a painless procedure. MRI scans are digital images which can be saved and stored on a computer. This makes their life even more durable and facilitates future study, research and cross-analysis. An MRI scan is an extremely accurate method of injury and disease detection throughout the body and is often used after all other testing techniques and procedures fail to provide sufficient information about the patient's health or medical condition. However, patients with heart pacemakers, metal implants or metal chips or clips cannot be scanned with MRI because of the effect of the magnet. Neurosurgeons use an MRI scan not only in defining brain anatomy but also in evaluating the integrity of the spinal cord after trauma. It is also used with problems associated with the vertebrae or intervertebral discs of the spine. Often injury can be avoided or more accurately directed after knowing the results of an MRI scan. During the MRI, Patients lie in a closed area inside the magnetic tube. Some patients can experience a claustrophobic sensation during the procedure. However, this can be tackled with the use of mild sedatives. 
there are chances of patients feeling dizzy and aching back due to lying on hard bed for long time there are otherwise no major side effects of an mri scan an mri scan takes 30 to 40 minutes an easier way to diagnose is through a ct scan which takes around 5 minutes cat is short for computer axial tomography a computed tomography or computed axial tomography scan uses a computer that takes data from several x-ray images of structures inside a human's or animal's body and converts them into pictures on the monitor of the computer tomography is the process of generating a two dimensional image of a slice or section through a three dimensional object a ct scan emits a series of narrow beams through the human body and it moves through an arc unlike an x ray machine which just sends one radiation beam the final picture is far more detailed than an x ray image as a result a ct scan is usually used to diagnose problems of the chest abdomen urinary tract liver pancreas gall bladder adrenal glands spleen pelvis arm or leg ct scan is usual is useful in getting a very detailed 3d image of certain parts of the body such as soft tissues the pelvis blood vessels the lungs the brain abdomen and bones it's often the preferred way of diagnosing many cancers the image helps the doctor confirm the presence of a tumor its exact size and location in the body or organ a scan of the head can provide the doctor with important information about the brain both mri and ct scans do not give information regarding the activity level of the organ or tissue hence ct scan comes to our rescue ct stands for positron emission tomography a pet scan uses a small amount of radioactive material which is the tracer the tracer is injected through a vein and most often on the inside of the elbow the tracer travels through the blood of the tissue and organ the patient has to wait for an hour or so for the tracer to travel throughout the body then the patient is made to lie down on a narrow table that slides into a large tunnel shaped scanner the pet detects signals from the tracer a computer changes the signals into 3d images which can be displayed on the computer screen the patient must lie still during the test too many movements can cause blurred images a pet scan detects the energy emitted by positively charged particles or positrons as the radio tracer is broken down inside the patient's body positrons are made this energy appears as a three dimensional image on the computer mirror the image reveals how many parts of the patient's body function by the way they break down the radio tracer a pet image will display different levels of positrons according to brightness and color when the image is complete it can be examined by a radiologist who reports his or her findings to the doctor a radiologist is a doctor who specializes in interpreting these types of images 
as well as MRI scans, CT scans, ultrasound and X-ray images. CT scans are generally used alongside X-rays or MRI scans. Doctors use CT scans as complementary to the main ones. A CT scan can reveal size, shape, positions and functions of organs. The test can be used to check brain function, diagnose cancer, heart problems, brain disorders and so forth. The patient is asked to be on empty stomach for 4 to 6 hours before the scan. The amount of the radio tracer used in the testing is very low. It is unlikely to cause any trouble to the patients. Now let us see memory and CT scan. CT scan is an excellent neuroimaging tool. Performance of any behavioral or cognitive task is marked by neuron activity distributed throughout the brain. Changes in this neuronal activity are accompanied by changes in blood flow. PET can measure these changes accurately and thus can identify brain areas that are differentially active during the performance of different tasks. With respect to the domain of memory, this means that brain areas related to specific memory processes can be studied using PET. This can be done by making the subjects do memory tasks within the PET scanner. A large study of patients with mild cognitive impairment revealed that results from cognitive tests and brain scans can work as early warning systems for the potential subsequent development of Alzheimer's disease. Research found that among 85 patients in the study with mild cognitive impairment, those with low scores on a memory recall test and low glucose metabolism in particular brain regions as detected through positron emission tomography had a 15-fold greater risk of developing Alzheimer's disease within two years compared to others in the study. About half of the older people with memory loss who meet the clinical definition of mild cognitive impairment will develop Alzheimer's disease within five years. As more and more PET data are collected, right now it is in the nascent stage. Commonalities among groups of studies will emerge and suggest models of neuroanatomical pathways that underlie memory processes. At the more global level, the PET studies have demonstrated how multiple forms of memory processes might interact. Verbal working memory tasks, elaborative semantic retrieval tasks, and episodic encoding tasks have all activated similar left prefrontal regions. Processing that requires verbal elaboration, which is deep processing, appears to activate left prefrontal cortex, whereas well automatized language tasks, which are shallow tasks, do not. PT is very useful in studying different brain abnormalities by comparing the activity patterns in healthy individuals against the patterns obtained in patients. For example, the focus seizure in an epileptic patient is often associated with decreased activity which can be observed through PET. Various psychiatric disorders such as schizophrenia and manic depression can result in altered PET activity as can Parkinson's disease, epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, 
cerebrovascular disorder, Alzheimer's disease and so forth. Let us now understand the two hemispheres of our brain. Imagine looking down through the top of your head onto the cortex of your brain. You would see that it is made up of two halves called hemispheres. On the left is the left brain and on the right is the right brain. The left and right brains are connected by an intricate network of nerve fibers called the corpus callosum. It was the ancient Egyptians who first noticed that the left brain tends to control the right side of the body while the right brain tends to control the left side of the body. Although each hemisphere is almost identical in terms of structure, both operate in entirely different ways and are associated with very different activities. This is known as specialization or lateralization. Let us talk about the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere in a little more detail. The left brain is the logical brain. It is responsible for words, logic, numbers, analysis, lists, linearity and sequence. It controls the right side of the body. People in whom the left brain is dominant may become scientists, lawyers, bureaucrats, accountants, architects, engineers and so forth. The right brain on the other hand is the creative brain responsible for rhythm, spatial awareness, color, imagination, daydreaming, holistic awareness and dimension. It controls the left side of the body. People in whom the right brain is dominant go on to become writers, poets, musicians, dancers, painters, spiritual masters, directors, actors or dramatists, nurse, etc. Medical studies of patients who have suffered various types of brain damage provide the first clue that certain complex psychological functions were lateralized on one side of the brain or the other side of the brain. The deficits observed in people with damage to either the left or the right hemisphere suggested that for most people, verbal abilities and speech are localized in the left hemisphere as are mathematical and logical abilities. When Broca's or Wernicke's speech areas in the left hemisphere are damaged, the result is aphasia, the partial loss or total loss of ability to communicate. Depending on the location of the damage, the problem may lie in recognizing the meaning of the word, in communicating verbally with others or in both of these functions. When the right hemisphere is damaged, the clinical picture is quite different. Language functions are not ordinarily affected by the person, but the person has great difficulty perceiving facial relations. A patient may have a hard time recognizing faces and even may forget a well-traveled tool. Despite the lateralization of specific functions in the two cerebral hemispheres, the brain normally functions as a unified whole because both the hemispheres continue to communicate with one another through the corpus callosum. Because the two hemispheres are in constant communication with one another, most of the knowledge of lateralized functions in humans was based on studies of people with brain damage that affected one of the hemispheres. The two hemispheres differ not only in terms of cognitive functions that reside in them, but also in their link with positive and negative emotions. EEG studies have shown the right hemisphere 
is relatively more active when negative emotions such as sadness and anger are being experienced. Positive emotions such as joy and happiness are accompanied by relatively greater left hemisphere activation. Now let us move to emotions and the hemispheric activation. Psychiatrists who were treating clinically depressed patients with electroshock treatments to either the right or the left hemisphere and they observed a striking phenomenon. The electric current temporarily disrupted neural activity in the targeted hemisphere. With the left hemisphere knocked out, forcing the right hemisphere to take charge, patients had what physicians termed as catastrophic reaction, wailing and crying until the shock effect wore off. But when they applied shock to the right hemisphere, allowing the left hemisphere to dominate, the patients reacted much differently. They seemed unconcerned, happy and sometimes even euphoric. Researchers noted a similar pattern of emotions in patients in whom one hemisphere had been damaged but lesions or strokes. These findings suggest that the left hemisphere activation may underlie certain positive emotions and right hemisphere functioning negative ones. To test this proposition, Richard Davidson and Fox obtained EEG measures of frontal lobe activity as people experienced positive and negative emotions. They found that when people felt positive emotions by recalling pleasurable experiences or watching a happy film, the left hemisphere was relatively more active than the right. But when sadness and other negative emotions were evoked by memory or watching a disgusting film, the right hemisphere became relatively more active. Moreover, the hemispheric pattern seems to be innate. Infants as young as 3 to 4 days old show a similar pattern of hemispheric activation. Left hemispheric activation, when given a sweet sucrose solution, which infants like, and right hemisphere dominance in response to a citric acid solution, which apparently disgusts them. Davidson and Fox also found individual differences in typical or resting hemispheric activation when they recorded people's EEG responses under emotionally neutral conditions. These resting differences predicted the tendency to experience positive or negative emotions. For example, human infants with resting right hemisphere dominance were more likely to become upset or cry if their mothers later left the room than those whose resting left hemisphere dominated. In adults, a higher resting level of right hemisphere EEG activity may be a risk factor for later development of adult depressive disorders. Now let us quickly summarize the points that we have already talked about. MRI or magnetic resonance imaging uses magnetic field and radio waves to create images of the body. It helps doctors in injury detection, location and severity. CAT or computed axial tomography makes use of x-rays to form two or three dimensional images of body parts. PET or position emission tomography uses radioactive material called tracer which is injected into the vein of the human body to produce a colorful depicting different activity levels image of the organ. PET helps doctors in studying brain abnormalities and functioning. The left hemisphere is called the logical brain while the right hemisphere is called the creative brain. 
the two seemingly distinct brains are connected to each other by the corpus callosum these distinct brains perform different functions corpus callosum is a thick band of nerve fibers which connect the brain cells in one hemisphere to those with the others the two hemispheres keep up a continuous conversation via this neural bridge research shows that left hemisphere governs positive emotions while the right hemisphere governs negative ones